she had a that video as I would say in Spanish and in Italian I think it's how Virchilo. Virchilo. So Virchilo, who's an assistant professor of food studies, the teaching stream out at, at UP Scarborough, and coordinator of the Sustainable Food and Farming Futures Research Cluster. She does participatory action research in physics and feminist geography, political ecology, critical development studies, with work focusing on linking the literature on agrarian and nutrition, transition, smallholder, livelihood development, rural urban food systems, and household food security in northern Ghana, where she's been working with within communities for over a decade. And so this is, I think, it's, we're gonna be, we're very lucky today to get a look into the work that she's been doing. Her scholarship also mobilizes research for advocacy coalitions, donors, NGOs, and government policy and practice to advocate for agroecology and food sovereignty. She will finalize in Al Jazeera, and publishes scholarly journals on Ambio and Third World Orderly. Today, we're gonna to hear about participatory action research partnerships now for global food sovereignty. Sierra, take it away. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thanks for that introduction and for coming today. Um, so I am going to bring, what I'm going to present today is focus more on the research partnerships that we're building and less on the theory and the methodology itself. So um, it's very exciting time for us. And the main takeaway message, though, the main takeaway message is essentially we're moving from doing research on food security to food sovereignty. And the reason for this is because instead of just doing research for partner organizations, where the research is being led and designed by them uh, themselves. So pictured here is a workshop that we held um, at the Ministry of Agriculture in Northern Ghana this past July. And it included some of the farmers and extension agents who I've been working with for over 10 years, um, who are meeting with the policymakers. Uh, with scholars, but also chefs, market vendors, nutrition experts, and all sorts of different stakeholders to try and shift um, policies. And what we're realizing, the conversation is focused around food sovereignty as opposed to food security, which is what the mainstream policy is. So today, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes. Um, or so, and in order to describe these research partnerships, it's important to set the context because these partnerships are based on um, the resistance currently to the African Green Revolution and the way it's playing out in Ghana. And talking about the alternatives that's being established is in resistance to this model. Then I'm gonna talk about the action research we're pursuing or the issue of us being not just scholar activists, but what Marty Isaac recently, uh, a professor at UTSC as well, coined uh, scholar organizing, not just scholar activists. So we see ourselves as more uh, in the mobilizing, connecting side of things, as opposed to just advocating and uh, describe some of these partnerships. So what is the African Green Revolution? For those who are not familiar, it, the Green Revolution is an agricultural development model that's existed uh, for decades uh, and played out in different parts of the world. Uh, really, it's essentially about the need to get small scale farmers who are seen as the most vulnerable to poverty, to food insecurity, to climate change, to intensify their food production so that they can reduce their poverty and create more food, which would make food cheaper and more accessible. And the way that this is done uh, is through a series of technologies like high yielding seed varieties, uh, heavy tillage, mechanization, uh, and mainly chemical fertilizers and other agrochemicals. Uh, but what is different in the African context, I think, is that this is a much more liberalized project where it's getting farmers who look like this, so uh, mixed crop farming with labor intensive technology, like the hoe, to look more like what you see on the right. So highly commercialized and integrated, not just into national supply chains, but global supply chains. So on the Af in the African context, there was a resurgence in funds for this Green Revolution by donors. So it's impossible to talk about this Green Revolution story without talking about the role of international development actors. And that's where I see my positionality as 
uh, Canadian whose taxpayers, um, tax taxpaying dollars go to a lot of the, these funds. Uh, and they fund now not just in the past, these funds go to the state to purchase these technologies. And the state was normally heavily subsidize these technologies and give them to small scale farmers. That's the way it was done mostly in the past. Now it's they're interested in developing the entire supply chain from the provider, um, small, usually small agribusinesses, the seed dealers, the fertilizer dealers, uh, and producers, uh, mostly large scale producers who contract uh, with the providers to work with peasant farmers so that they can aggregate and provide it to the market. What's important to note is that the, the subsidies are not going directly to the peasant farmer or the small scale farmer anymore. They're going to these business relations. That creates a different type of relationship between uh, these vulnerable populations and these subsidies. So the, the main staples are in this context are maize and rice, although there's some subsidies for soy. Those are the commodity crops. And we see the familiar set of donors, different types of donors, uh, bilateral, multilateral, and new philanthropy like the Gates Foundation, which is a huge player in this. So when we talk about the Green Revolution, uh, we talk about the 10 countries on the continents in which Gates is, is pushing, uh, and that is Ghana is one of them. The new alliance uh, is not so new, maybe uh, over 10 years old at this point, but it's an alliance of bilateral donors that are working with big agricultural corporations to make this happen. So uh, like with Yara, and uh, this is what I've been studying and that's the model. So um, I, I am uh, pursue, I've been pursuing this research for over a decade, which started actually uh, after my undergraduate degree when I was a student here at the University of Toronto, uh, studying political science and African studies. So a lot of people ask me, how did I get into this line of work, where I started off as a green revolutionist. So I was hired by a Canadian NGO to go to the farm and do research with peasant farmers to understand two things. One, why farmers weren't adopting the technologies, and two, how we could get them to do that. So the way I did this work was to work with the service providers, usually um, ministry extension agents, who facilitate these contract arrangements. And after about six months of working on a farm like this, this is, um, this is an African yam uh, farm. The project being delivered was to show farmers uh, the effectiveness of an insecticide. So what we did is I spent two weeks working on the farm, taking this yam mini sets, which is the seed, dipping an insecticide, planting. We planted about a thousand nanos, backbreaking work. And only a hundred germinated. So huge, utter failure. And this was a moment for me where I realized, okay, something is wrong. Why isn't this working? Who decided that this technology was the was thing to pursue? And I began to ask those questions and decided to then, after another six months um, on the farm across the northern regions, go back to study this for my graduate studies. So I believe that the research that I'm pursuing stems from this positionality as a, as a Canadian working. Uh, on the farm, on the field, uh, with farmers. And so this research is really uh, about the farmers. Did you find out what happened to that? The, Why? No. 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 And, and that's a very common problem. And if it's not the insecticide, it's another crop, it's another seed. The important message is that it's always a foreign imposed idea or model and not something that's rooted in a place. Uh, and, and I should add, I was working with the lead role model farmer, someone who won all sorts of awards. So it wasn't just like because the farmer didn't know what they were doing. It was selected and the whole thing kind of failed. So I, I study these issues in Ghana, which serves as a really important, unique case study for the African continent, because it's both a model, an exceptional model, and a representation of what's going on. So Ghana was one of the first African countries to meet the Millennium Development Goal of halving hunger rates. But when you look at what's going on within the country, there are major uh, disparities between the North and the South, with the North not achieving these goals. And um, not coincidentally, that's where all the donor projects 
are based to try and resolve the hunger crisis. And it's very much an issue where the majority of the food is produced there and also hunger rates are highest. So this really paradoxical question of hungry farmers who are producing food. And not a coincidence why I ended up there as a development worker. Um, and like the rest of the continents, a majority of the food supply and its economy comes from, from food production. One reason for this disparity is it's a different agroecological zone. So like much of the Sahel and much of the continent, it's drying and highly susceptible to a changing climate. There's only one growing season, whereas the South is two. And there's um, political, economic, and historical reasons. So since uh, the era of colonialism, uh, a lot of investment in infrastructure was put into commodity crops in the south of the country, like cocoa, which still a third of the government budget goes towards. So though that legacy still exists. And during the British, British colonialists uh, forcibly conscripted male labor from the north to work on those farms in the south, and those migratory patterns still still exist today to some extent. So the the legacies of, of colonialism still creates these disparities between the north and the south. So I'm not going to get into my methodology. Uh, it is participatory action research with a whole lot of different methods that I've been testing and using and mixing for, for over 10 years. Uh, and this meeting here is not a focus group. It is a um, meeting that I attended, observed with the local government uh, agencies working with farming groups to establish these contract arrangements. So I attended a lot and have and continue to attend a lot of these meetings to understand the relationships between donor assistance, government assistance, and farmers and then spending time on farms. So it's mixed me methods based on grounded theory. So I tell you all this because what we're building in Ghana is built off of um, this research. So thinking about the Green Revolution, the three technologies that were investigated was one, farmers were choosing to adopt the local high yield, the high yielding seed varieties that were being developed as a way to cope with the changing climate. So because the rainfall is becoming shorter and shorter or the growing season is becoming shorter, people were choosing to opt in for the 90 day varieties versus the 130 day varieties. But major trade-offs for food security. One of them being when, so although the corn, the maize, uh, crop would have a lot more corn cobs on it. So that was seen as an improvement for, for marketing. When you took that corn and you processed it into flour for consumption, there was actually a lot of farmers reported that there was less flour. That flour was sweeter than the landrous varieties or the traditional varieties, and it couldn't be stored for as long. So although it might have been good for business if you sold your harvest as it was, for household food security and your community and the way you consumed it, there were major implications. But the biggest worry uh, for me of all was that because only one type of crop was being improved uh, or being adopted, other types of crops like other staples, but other mixed forms of cropping uh, was being abandoned. And so that dietary diversity was missing, which huge implications for food security. And every farmer talks to me about the same thing. The same question. They are only adopting the seed because it's open pollinating, which means that they don't have to purchase it every year. They can save it and they can share it. As soon as it becomes hybrid, meaning it's closed, or um, a form of biotechnology, they will not adopt it. So much so that the government extension agents that I work with abandon pushing those crops altogether. So for them, it's about autonomy. I want control over my seed and my farm. It's about sovereignty. I don't want to depend on anyone else or any corporation for the seed. The second um, set of technologies that people talked about was the use of tractors, which like over 90% of the people in the communities I worked in were using heavy tillage. So no animal traction, no hand plowing, um, all heavy, which was very surprising to me. Um, obviously there are labor uh, saving benefits, 
but also important for climate change because it loosens this hard, drying soil that is suffering in heat stress and improving germination, right? Because water can, can penetrate through uh, soil that is becoming more arid. Uh, compromises, of course, are reduced soil fertility, eliminating that important topsoil um, and changing the composition of soil. Uh, but the biggest concern reported was that it was deepening disparities within communities. Not everyone could own a tractor. And people were making a lot of money off of renting out those tractors. And year after year, those tractors were getting more and more expensive. So again, it's about control over your piece, over your farm. Uh, we don't want to have to depend on others for these tractors. And the government wasn't subsidizing these, unlike the, the seed. And then the last set of no, technologies was the adoption of agrochemicals and PK fertilizer. Obviously, huge uh, soil infertility uh, concerns. People who are using these chemicals for this. And I would say in this context, it's really only about in the past 25 years where this was adopted by many, many farmers before. So it's, it's kind of relatively new, uh, but also in a changing climate, uh, using agrochemicals to deal with rapid weed growth after floods uh, due to climate change is really useful. But major trade-offs. One of the most striking trade-offs for me is the way people talked about how they feel like they are addicted to agrochemical use. They can't, they're in this addictive cycle. They can't get out of it and it's worsening their soil fertility. So although they're adopting this fertilizer in the short term to deal with that season, it, it's compromising it in the future. And they describe their relationship to the input dealers that were being um, subsidized by donors and their government as their drug dealers. So you can imagine the kinds of relationships and dependencies that they have. So if a, if a researcher goes to a farmer and says, what do you want, farmer? Like any good drug addict, you would say, I want more drugs. But that isn't necessarily the best thing for you. And so um, the literature on transitioning away from agrochemical use is well established. Uh, it, it's about 15 years. How to transition away from this? You can't just remove people cold turkey like any drug addiction, um, like any drug addict. You have to transition them. But how this is done in this kind of context is there's not a lot of research, especially with these vulnerable groups. So that's kind of what we're investigating. And then the last challenge, major challenge, is the issue around land. When I first started working in this context 12 years ago, land was well at the bottom of the set of issues, like maybe six or seven on the list of concerns farmers would talk about. Today, it's right at the top of the list. The rate of dispossession happening is extremely concerning, to say the least. And it's happening, it's not a land grab happening like a multinational corporation or a government is, is grabbing all this land. The land is governed from below, so the, the grabbing is happening from within communities. And it's because some people can access these contract arrangements, these subsidies, some people have more power than others, have more entitlement to the land. So chiefs, local leaders, certain family elders, uh, and they are using development assistance uh, to lease the land that belongs to the community. Uh, and based on values here that are communally governed, everyone in the community is supposed to have enough land to feed their families. That's the way the traditional system works. But with any good capitalist system, making money off of the land, making it efficient, uh, also translates to some people losing access. And this was one of the major concerns, especially for climate change, because one of the the biggest ways that people manage their soils is through leaving land fallow, which farmers were choosing no longer to do because they, as soon as you stop farming on that land, someone else may take it. And so they have to farm and over farm. So that's one major uh, implication of development assistance explicitly directly uh, causing this. So this was uh, published from my PhD research. Right after my PhD, I spent my postdoc uh, serving as a scholar activist. I went directly to Global Affairs Canada, 
which is the main funder for the government program in Ghana. So as a Canadian, I felt it was my responsibility to, to translate these findings for the policymakers. And so I held, I spent six months working to host policy labs with the research division, the food security, the food systems division, and all the environmental divisions. Lots of conversations. I've translated the research uh, for the IDRC, which is the main funder for uh, foreign aid research and different ministries across Ghana, uh, and became extremely skeptical, extremely um, disheartened, so much so that I abandoned this hope of a career in government because no one was interested in evidence. There's obviously policymaking is about politics. And I realized that if I wanted to instill change, I needed to play that politics. But as an academic, as a researcher, that's not what I do. That's not what I'm best suited for. Let me support those organizations, those advocates who are better suited for that. And that's what we're trying to do today. So translating this research also for, I should mention, the public, what was, what was striking to me is we were um, cold called by Al Jazeera to write these op-eds. So it was like, this story that you're trying to tell within donors, you need to tell it to the public. And it needs to be accessible to civil society because when they go to the UN World Food Summit, when they go to uh, trade meetings, uh, they use these op-eds to get their message across. So when you publish these op-eds, so, so all, of, all of this is not just about educating the public, it's used by civil society in strategic ways to shift policy. So I thought as a researcher, as, a, as someone who could write, I could contribute in these ways. So uh, mobilizing this research, one of the, one of the things that I, I still feel like is one of my biggest accomplishments was not getting just getting the PhD, it was being uh, cold called again by civil society groups in Ghana who I had never met to use this research. So they asked me to present and mobilize the research for them. And uh, that to me is one of the biggest signs that your research re is resonating with certain groups. And um, we've been building this relationship. So again, more policy labs uh, in the room, all done over Zoom, I should add. COVID was useful in, in that sense, in that way. Uh, and these groups are advocating in Ghana, uh, the way that they're resisting the Green Revolution is through not just providing evidence that the Green Revolution is not working, they're actually working towards alternatives. And for them, the alternative is a different model, and that is agroecology. Agroecology is a, a form of farming, a form of a style of a model for farming, which takes kind of old knowledge, traditional knowledge, indigenous knowledge of farming, that is based off that particular land with new knowledge. And because it's based on particular places, it's not scalable. So it doesn't fit within this kind of business model of like pilot something and then scale it and make money. It's very contextual. And they believe that this is what's best for peasant farmers. It's the most social justice oriented. So it's not just about sustainable farming or conservation farming, it's about justice and it has to work for small scale farmers. There's not a lot of research about how this plays out in these kinds of contexts. The second thing is about sovereignty. It's about, we want to pursue agroecology because we believe it will translate to us having more control over not just our farms, but our markets and our household diets and our restaurants and our kitchens. We want to eat the food that we want to eat. We don't want to rely on these technologies and these seeds and these crop varieties and these uh, products that don't resonate with us. And that was very interesting to me because the conversation went from being about farming to being about food. The conversation went from being farming is so difficult, climate change, poverty to food is our culture, it's our history, it's our enjoyment, it's our love. It's our tradition. And when you change the conversation to something more positive, um, it's, it's sometimes easier to have that dialogue. So we decided to work towards building a movement of uh, food sovereignty. Uh, and I say we, this term that Marnie Isaac uh, mentioned to me uh, a couple of weeks ago, she, like her, I also see myself less as an activist and as, a, as an organizer, someone who is kind of also an activist, of course, but also organizing and connecting and doing the work that I can 
do as a as someone who's in the global north who has all of these connections and access to resources to connect and organize for others and so we're we're building working towards building a movement that brings different kinds of institutions together uh, and working uh, not just on farms, but also in markets, territorial markets, regional markets, and in kitchens. So this uh, picture is uh, one of my favorite agricultural extension agents. He, I like to say I owe a lot to him. He, he taught me a lot about uh, most of what I know. And he is describing to farming groups a uh, pilot of some of these farming techniques, the way that it was uh, panning out. And we have some of our papers that that I've published based on the work we've done, uh, but but moving we're moving beyond just the farm to how this works in a wider uh, region. So this is about in having practice be informed by research, but also how research is informed by practice. So the partnerships uh, we I've been developing uh, through mostly the funding by SHRP uh, in classic research funds like Insight Development Grant, but also Connections Grants, which is about mobilizing knowledge. Uh, and you can do a lot even with these small amounts of funding. But we hope to have wider partnerships uh, in future that bring together uh, other groups in other parts of the world as well and across the African region. And because there's so many different types of organizations involved, the types of outputs we were develop developing are also different. So it's not just policy briefs or reports anymore. It's now podcasts, it's now photo essays, it's now Instagram stories and engages different types of audiences that these organizations serve and feel they need to serve. So for example, this photo essay, whilst oh, maybe you would think only a few people would read it, it's not very academic in the classic sense, actually everyone in Ghana, that's the thing they wanted me to print out. The photos of the foods, the, you know, a lot, along with the story. And that got me thinking about the kinds of writing and co-writing we can do in future. Uh, and uh, Instagram has been very, very useful for connecting with different players and stakeholders and showing these photos and showing these videos. Uh, one of the biggest outputs we've accomplished so far is a workshop that we held this past July, which was a week long, uh, and it included meetings that we held at the uh, local university with scholars focusing on local farming and food knowledge. Uh, also, uh, an influence day that we had at the ministry, as I mentioned earlier, we visited agroecological farms to show others, you know, what's possible, what's feasible. And I would also say we had a curated dinner by a chef who reimagined what local food heritage looks like. And, and from there, it's kind of spirals. So what was interesting for me is when you give a little bit of money to people, they can take these ideas in different directions that you would have never suspected because it's not in theory, it's not in, it's not anywhere in the literature. Uh, one of them being not just agroecology, but the importance of food heritage. People are quickly realizing how much their diets are changing quickly and are, are very um, worried about what that's going to lead to in the next one or two generations. So I have this um, video, it's about six minutes long and it summarizes this workshop really, really well. You're the first people to see it. So uh, afterwards, I, I look forward to hearing what you think. We are happy that we can have this collaboration as an university. But I was here for, we are here to generate knowledge. But it's not enough to generate it. What's more important is to share it and have that knowledge can be used to force change in this way. I'm not that those modernizers, but what kind of modernizers are in there? There are what? 
This is for me, the Malayashi. Eight is about inscription plans, about preserving some and probably introducing new technologies for preserving the seeds so that they don't probably get brought in. Trying to avoid the problem of post harvest losses, which is common to use. And then I'm going for it. This workshop is based on people who see the harms and effects of the African Green Revolution on small scale farmers. Yeah, so, Silver is a local issue. They are promoting what we call endogenous development. We are looking at the Ghana's food system that uh, produces additive culturally appropriate and nutritious food for the population. So, we are looking more at issues around small farmers, especially women. I realize they were with this. We were supposed to do everything for them because there were no more synthetic uh, chemicals that was applied to our food uh, products. No one was supposed to do You know, the answer for you it is difficult to get, but when you plan well, you can get a lot of money and get from the scratch. It became a personal design machine that a lot of people get in foreign dish. Because that is not what's going to determine whether I'm a good chef or not. Because I realize that the pieces that we eat today is somebody to be healthy. That's the typical movement of an Italian person. The, you know, the big dog you're eating today is from Indonesia. But somebody's not healthy. So the question is, how did all these things come about? So you cannot understand that if you don't talk about power. So food security, we should be talking all stakeholders about the actions and the actions of artists. The reality is that as was mentioned in the presentation, we are moving away from food security to talking about food sovereignty. Food sovereignty goes beyond access and availability to talking about issues of, you know, uh, cultural heritage, eating what you want to eat at a particular time, deciding what you want to eat. But in the case of food security, we're just talking about availability and access. And so we need to be able to, you know, rethink. I actually started from this in Dawa Dawa, and Dawa Dawa is a local. And um, food ingredients in our locality. It's a very delicacy in this locality that if you prepare your soup and it is not found in it, we consider the food to be incomplete. One of the very um, important things that we've done so far is the Buy Ghana Build Down. Wherefore, at home, we encourage everyone to buy Ghanaian made brands. So it could be a name brand, it could be from a local market woman, it could be a local yobokari seller close to your place of residence. The point is make an intentional effort in buying local. So it's like a building in itself. That is how we the building. That's how we come before where it looks like the installation or the other things. This time is the soil itself. So I've been working with uh, some of the guys from UDS and other places like those who are irrigation experts and others who have a question about So we're going to build these irrigation systems here. The floor is going to be done finally. It's going to everything is going to be brown. And you have like the net coming through which produces the light. Research came out to the world that all our oils that we eat are not good for us. So we're told to stop eating coconut oil, shea nut butter oil, palm oil. Today, the truth, the science proves that these are the healthiest oils on the planet. We were encouraged by this so-called new research to share that of our ancestors, and we started eating hydrogenated fats, which are now giving us all the cardiovascular diseases. There are countries where they are so big time on pushing organic, that organic food even is sold at a premium. Ask yourself why. Why do human beings in another country prefer to pay more for food that is not brewing with chemicals? It's not simply because we want to eat. It's not about food security. It's about what does your liver, your, your, your kidney, your skin say about the food that you're eating. The Marota, when you wear this, you need to walk. 
And just to, to, to make the statement clear that we are at war, whether we like it or not, we are at war. There's always fight between whatever we are eating and whatever somebody is waiting on us to eat. And just to remind us that as we eat this meal, remember that we are at war. And your decision to deal with tell us where to start. Okay? <laughs> So I hope that made sense. The trailer was created for the organizations in Ghana. So sometimes it may not translate well for a global audience, but I think what it does is it represents well how people are moving beyond this idea of food security to food sovereignty and thinking beyond the farm. So the chefs actually did an outstanding job translating what was being done from the farm in the markets with conversations and research to how they can can work with it in their kitchens and and in the education that they're doing and uh, we also had so that was something that was unique that i didn't anticipate and it's kind of emerging as a, in pub in research i'm hoping to publish more uh, we also had a journalist come. And this actually we learned from the donors supporting the Green Revolutionists in Ghana. They are doing trainings about how to, trainings with journalists about how to convince the public to adopt biotechnology, adopt GMC. And so we thought, well, we could hire a journalist to, to not to train them, just to, to hear the messages going on. And he is, since July, writing countless articles, publishing, including um, an eight-minute news segment that played on the main uh, Ghana media across the country like all day I had calls being like why are you on TV right now what's going on I think that aired in August uh, and so there is this real interest in need to have alternative views that are so domineering uh, from because they're funded from from foreigners I won't play that video the the last the, one of the last outputs that emerged from this workshop that I never anticipated was by Chef Bureau himself. So we had this curated dinner. Uh, dinner is sort of a fine, more fine dining style, three course meal dinner that most people in that context have never experienced before. And the goal um, was for him to reimagine the local traditional food to, uh, to appeal, appeal to that style. That's what he does best. What he calls, I think, um, and he's online now, so let's see if I do justice to, to this, but um, what he reimagines as like Afrofusion cuisine and food. And so what he did was for that dinner, he hired photographers and videographers to, to shoot a documentary based on this dinner, this one dinner to tell a story of Northern Guinean cuisine and where he thinks it's headed. So that clip in the trailer that you saw of him saying like we are at war was part of his Im imagination or his thinking and theorizing around, you know, if we don't do something now about holding on to our food heritage and reimagining it, it's going to be lost. And once it's gone, it's gone. So for me, that was very powerful and it's inspired a lot of uh, research. On no November 22nd, we're having an event here that will screen a documentary. But it won't just be here, actually. The main event will be in Accra. Um, his organization that he's part of, the Ghana Food Movement, which I'll show, uh, is, is going to have an entire panel discussion based off of this workshop and the documentary to start having conversation in the capital city about Northern Ghanaian cuisine, a place that is very far removed from that place, uh, from the capital city. So that, I think, will be an exciting place to be in. So I'm, he created a trailer. Are, are we interested in watching the trailer for the video? It's a couple of minutes long. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Completely directed by him. He like sent it to me and I was like, this is <laughs> This is a very The is so the is so the 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 the
Join us and as we to the children. Thank you. And also exchange goods and services. So, even though I get it, I still do not have a plastic box for the machines. You tell me that printer is for the usage of just CDs. And so, wherever the market is, it's always a joy to be there because you get to the end, 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 Chef Abilo, a visionary orchestrates in a remarkable endeavor, combining age old techniques with an innovative spirit to meticulously experiment with finest recipes and craft an elevated dining experience that pays for its tradition. Also, in this project is Chef Kwame Pierre. This distinguished maestro of the culinary realm have gleaned their expertise from the timeless wisdom of ancestral traditions. So, for the kind of service style, you know, it is more like fine dining, um, street chef team style. Um, it's it, it comprises of a lot of elements. So, the foods that we tried this evening are, I think, in my mind, very special because they're both familiar and unusual. So um, I've been working on uh, in the northern parts here for uh, over a decade. So I'm familiar with a lot of the foods here, but I've never eat, eaten them in this way. Well, it's very interesting. Uh, all the two chefs here today. Um, the avocado, the wasabi salad. Uh, that's certainly uh, a deliberate attempt to make the wasabi salad sustain in our minds, in our taste buds, and get the color activity. Uh, the name that we use, which is the, the, the termites that we use on the on our family, um, which is a sort of protein, uh, no connection with the basis. Based on how I ate the tea that was, was, was the best for me, because I was able to play on the plate. And it was amazing. The taste reminded me of how I wanted to put the things in, in, in the day. I have always said that I have a little things and I have a good part for so whatever that you need from the beans. This I think is made of beans. So when I see things that I had years ago, I become excited. All right, so my name is Chef Aguro. Um, I'm a chef from Northern Ghana, and I work for the Ghana movement. Um, I say, uh, I mean, some people, some people, funny enough, call me a chef from the north, or some of my friends even say king of the north because uh, it's my passion to see northern food um, get to global heights. Okay, so. Again, the, this documentary was created not necessarily for a global audience per se. So, so in the wider documentary, there's going to be a feature for those of you who love food and want to hear more about what food is like from this place. Uh, that's what the documentary kind of gets more into. And it's the way I, I see it, 
is that it's really for an, um, an audience in Ghana that isn't familiar with the North. Uh, so it's, and, and also it's for the Northern audience because it reimagines that local cuisine. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that's very, uh, it's a very interesting way to take sort of the politics of food in this particular place. So I've learned a lot, even just from watching this documentary, when you know a lot about that context, the choices that people are making for, for particular purposes are worth considering and bringing into your into the research, into the partnerships. And so that entire documentary was shot and imagined by the chef who has his own um, interests and he's working with an organization that has its own interests. And so that has been a useful point to study as well from an academic uh, standpoint. So do come on November 22nd. Uh, the documentary is about 30 minutes long and we will have a panel discussion and people in our crowd will be there. It'll be nice to feel, feel part of that uh, place. Uh, so essentially uh, talking about uh, moving from food security to issues of food sovereignty based on that wider politics of the green revolution going on. Uh, and also just the wider multiple crises where we see stark increase in, in the rate of hunger due to the pandemic and the uh, war on Ukraine. Uh, with the rise of cost of food, the fertilizer uh, shortages, all of this has led to this moment where people cannot just talk about a technical project of food security, of feeding people. It, we have to talk about taking control of the system. Um, and we're doing this through experimenting with agroecology on the farm, but also different business models, uh, different culinary models, I guess. What's interesting to me is when they talk about food heritage, they talk about it in ways that are similar to agroecology, which is blending the old farming techniques or cooking techniques with new. So there's not this idea that we should romanticize the past and revert back, but cherish what we need and what we know and love and, and innovate and, and bring in something that's reimagined. So it's, it's definitely thinking about post-development ideas um, that we're, we are beginning to study. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is um, my career ambition is to link this research with my teaching. So I am bringing all of this content into a course on food sovereignty next semester, but there is a real need, I think, by these organizations that they would love people in other parts of the world to take part in different ways. So they want students to come volunteer and work with them. They want farmers are constantly talking about bring, you know, here it's hard to get meetings with people. No one has time there. They're like begging people to come visit their farms. And so for me, the dream um, would be to bring students in these sort of, if you want to call them study abroad, study tours, what, whatever you want to call them, um, to learn about this place, to learn about the politics of this place, to learn and to contribute in a way that is, um, the way that I, I did, which is through hands-on applied uh, learning and the organizations are building spaces to accommodate for this. And so I think one thing we could do as, as, a, as professors uh, is to, to support these endeavors. Um, so imagining learning in sort of more of an open classroom concept where you get, you know, classroom could be the farm, it could be a kitchen, um, it could be through workshops and, and teaching students in these different multimedia outputs that the organizations can use. So we hope to put, for example, um, a partnership engage grant together that will go to support this newly established kitchen uh, to support their learning efforts to monitor and evaluate it with um, the Ghana food movement. I won't show a video um, of the Ghana food movement now in the interest of time. It's a, it's a minute long, but they see themselves their organization as knowledge brokers or knowledge producers. And I was like, that's what a university does. Like everything they do is around this idea of research translating in and, and for the public, for market vendors connecting. And I was like, that's that's something I think um, the academy can can contribute towards to make sure it is, you know, gold standard. <laughs> uh, so that's the end. Thank you for your time. I want to show appreciation to the farmers, the communities that have continued to welcome me um, and, and teach me most of what I know. 
uh, and the extension agents, and then all of the funders and all of you who uh, can also continue to indulge me in this work and support me. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. We've got some time for any questions or concerns or complaints. Okay, I have a question. Um, so I'm as a Canadian scholar in academia, you're working with farmers. Um, are you working with other like academics in Ghana? Yes. So um, I have one of my main uh, collaborators is now actually the dean, uh, but he was a professor in the summer, a senior professor at you know, one of the main universities in the north, and so he handles more of the academic scholarly side uh, because. My network has been more with practice stemming from my work. And when you're on the farm level, you're not necessarily well connected to the broader um, pieces, like the policymakers and the scholars. And he did an amazing job curating a um, special set of scholars who are thinking critically about these issues. There's not many of them in Ghana. There's the academy in Ghana is a place that very much needs to be decolonized themselves. So it's not just a matter, and I've had these conversations with those at the IDRC. It's not, the IDRC is very commendable in that they very much focus on giving funding to, to universities on, in the global south, including Africa. One problem is not all universities have the capacity to handle the funds, and so the same universities get funding, like not this university I've been collaborating with, another one. Um, but, they say we can't even just send them money because they themselves just reproduce the green revolution style, the kinds of methodologies that, that we do already in the North. And so I work with these scholars, there's not many of them who are asking these critical questions and they have come to me, they came to me and they were like, we need assistance in sort of training in critical methodologies, critical theories. Um, and also we need help pushing against this hegemonic ideas in the academy because we can't even get proposals passed, let alone like within within their faculty. Students can't even get their 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 proposals defended. Yeah. You know? I so guess that's, that was my question is like this yeah. this shift from like food security that like most global south countries who have experienced food security, that's where their research needs to really be rooted in and like how have you how have you seen that? It, yeah, it's just happening. I, 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 I would be, it, it would be uh, um, not accurate for me to say the shift is happening in the academies. It's not. Most of, professors don't get paid in, in Ghana. They make very little money. So any research they do has to be funded from the outside. And so a lot of the questions being funded is by donors. And so, so it's it's the same reproduced uh, knowledge production system. And then literally, I had a meeting with this junior professor who's a feminist political ecologist scholar, amazing work on the history of cassava in Ghana. Sat down with her, she's like, I'll go to these meetings to participate in these participatory research projects. And the professors are like, shh, stop asking all these questions. I need to get paid. I need this, just give them what they want, let's go. And it's like, this is not what I want to do here. Try something different. If I was working for the government, if I was working Canadian government, and if I was working for the donor agencies, I wouldn't be able to do the work that I'm doing now. That's what I see my role as a scholar. Shirk, and to some extent the IDRC, not entirely, Shirk is does does support critical, open-ended research that is flexible. And so that's why I position myself here. Um, so that's what I see my role as. And there's, I think I wanna also, my ambition is to also serve on committees at this local university to try to move the needle on critical theory to be another person of, of influence, I guess. Um, and also curriculum changes don't happen like they do have, happen here. They, they're, it's like a highly structured, thing. So it's not like I can be like, oh, add this to your course like we do here. It doesn't happen that way. It's highly structured. So the other ways in which we can shift 
scholarship and curriculum and teaching is through these like workshops and like when I had a, a presentation like this there like a hundred people came it, it was not it, it's there's a huge interest and demand for these things it's just all being funded from these other forces so yeah I was wondering if you could just tell us like maybe tell us a little bit more about the difference in cuisines because you mentioned the north, like it's not known in the south, right? Like when I think of getting food, it's sort of pretty, you know, just the food and that's it. Is it because of the Sahel? Is it is it more is it like culture of sort of Malian food, like that kind of thing? And how because you said that it was a reimagining of northern food, but if the northern food didn't have already exist in an imaginary of the south, is there a gap? Like absolutely what's happening. Absolutely. So this is a new project for me. So my insight development grant is just beginning. I'm just beginning to understand, like, because so this is part of the issue when you focus in a particular place for your research, you have no comparable perspective. So I've been so embedded in Northern Guinean cuisine. I was, that's what Northern Guinean food is to me as a researcher. That's not what it is to most Guineans or the di African diaspora or wider region, right? So like Jala, African jala to me is like very different than what a uh, Guinean jala looks like in Toronto. Um, so I'm still trying to to picture and I, what this is, and I defer and delegate to the northern chefs who are doing this work because obviously they have the palates and the history and the the lived experience to to. What I find interesting about Chef Biro is, um, he lives in Accra but he's a northern boy, which is very rare. Like when I met him, I was like, we need, to, we need to go eat, we need to sit, because you are blowing my mind right now. How did you, how did you northern boy end up with these Ogunis, these white people, and these like expats and this diaspora group doing this fine dining cuisine? Because you are a stranger here, like I am a stranger here. And he, he told me his story and he, so what he's doing in his reimagination is like showing what tradition looks like in so he's like called as the northern chef and so I think what he's trying to figure out like how do I reimagine but also pay homage like he says to northern Guinea so, so it's, it's not that people in in Accra don't know what northern Guinean food looks like um maybe they haven't eaten it often just like a northern Guinean knows what fufu is and these other things um, they eat them all the time, but uh, there's certain dishes that, so wasa wasa is like an example of a dish that is being pushed or ingredients like dawa dawa, which is um, African uh, locust bean that's been fermented into spice that is being pushed as like a Northern thing um, that everyone should adopt and use. So I'm still trying to piece it together and it's, and that's why I really appreciate food studies and working with the chefs because it's it's kind of taking the research in a new trajectory that I couldn't I would have never anticipated and have never seen in the world of peasant studies and right. very change that I that who's codified who's what is it just is it the taste is it like a texture the taste that everyone knows or is that has there been codification of the I, cuisine at a certain point right maybe so so I mean the sh chefs have explained to me northern cuisine is different from the south in that it's um it looks different, it has fewer ingredients, it's eaten a little bit differently. Uh, so it's it's many, many things. And I think even they are, for the first time, thinking back to their childhood. And now that they are living in these other places, being like, oh, people eat things differently. Also, it's in resistance to the tr culinary training they've received, which is all based on like Italian and French cuisine. So for them, their ambition is to actually change the, the Curriculum, oh. chef training. And take the spoon away and eat your hand. Exactly. Yeah. The, and the other thing I wanted to mention quickly is that I think that the course, one of the options you might want to investigate is just using an ICM, the International Course Module, okay. right? Which is quick, right? Like a week or something, you can do it during during break. And it's a lot easier, I think, to set up than like a study abroad. Yeah, I think it might be a good place to start. There's other conversations happening that people are roping me into slowly uh, because I think there's other. Others doing research in Ghana on similar issues, uh, like maybe health 
or something. And so they're like, maybe we can combine our efforts and do something that has bigger scope. I don't know. So yeah, that that's my, and I've been waiting to be sort of a salaried yeah. worker that's permanent somewhere to really dive into this, but. And do you want to plug your course? What's the, what's the code? Oh, I don't, I don't know what the code, I forget the code is, but yeah, please take, come take Food Sovereignty. So we have a lot of content, uh, multimedia content, um, including interviews uh, with farmers, with market vendors, with professors that, and, and even podcasts with different advocacy organizations that are going to just, every class will have alongside a reading some of this multimedia that will be featured in. Second and third year? It's a fourth year, fourth year. in food studies. Okay. Yeah, so please look, it's a um, special topics course, I think. And that's good to know because sometimes special topics gets lost, like the subtitle. Gets yeah, lost. I don't think the subtitles even featured. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it'll be focused on food. Sound Sorry, about that. yeah, please. Uh, do you have a question? That's good to ask. Uh, it sounds like a critical studies department, like a critical equity studies department, but it's yeah, no, so it's in food studies uh, at UTSC. I'm not sure, I think it might be, I don't know where it might be in culinaria, but I'm not sure. Uh, so thank, thank you so much, Vera, for sharing you know, your trajectory and, and your research. I and mean, it's just amazing that so uh, my compliments and everybody's compliments, I guess, uh, in, in doing this, this magnificent work. I want to take a step back, uh, knowing, you know, very little about, about Ghana and like you, like, but, you know, these, these are questions that are similar to questions that the farmers and activists having on the latitudes. Like, so I want to like push you towards helping those of us that work in other regions of the world, like, what can we learn in this period? What do we take away from the work that, uh, that uh, you know, the chefs, the farmers, and the, the, the scholar academics, uh, your stuff included, can, can learn uh, in, other, in other regions of the global south, in Latin America, and in other ways that. It's a good question because I think so much we have learned about the Green Revolution has come from other parts of the Global South, and so much we have learned about food sovereignty has come from other parts of the Global South. And so it's been a lot of learning already from this context, from those other places. And I think one thing coming out of these contexts that might maybe not differ or compare is this big, and, and I think it's all time bound, right? Like as a geographer, place matters, time matters. And so in this place, at this particular moment with these multiple crises going on, uh, people are responding in ways that are uh, a bit unique. So I think for me, agroecology is for whatever reason that we're still trying to uncover and unpack, uh, kind of the main alternative being pushed. So like the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa is the main regional body. A lot of the groups we work with in Ghana directly uh, feed into that regional group. And they work with, they have a lot of like the main, main voice with the global um, spaces where they connect with other parts of the world or other food sovereignty movements. And I think for them, they're really coming to terms with like what does agroecology agroecology look like in those particular places? Because uh, it's so context specific, which certain crops, certain varieties uh, are have never been talked about, have never been featured. So the and then the third thing I would say that that we can learn from the third thing I would say is about um food heritage and what these chefs are doing. They're really collaborating and learning a lot from the African diaspora. Um, that so, so African studies scholars, when they talk about the how many states are there in Africa, 54 states, they name the African diaspora as, as an additional state. And so these chefs are really um, learning from these other places, these other groups, in terms of what they're taking back their culinary heritage, what that looks like. So I think 
Other places have a lot to learn in terms of like what, what cuisine could be reimagined, re what farming techniques could re be reimagined because it's so place-based. And then also in their resistance to these multiple forces. So the Green Revolution um, is focused in Africa right now. And the way it's playing out, as I was mentioning, is different than in other points. It's very, it's very liberalized. So learning about how I think there's a lot to learn in that in that process of resistance in its relationship to donors and global corporations. It's very liberalized. What, what do you mean? Like I mean, so this the, there's not a lot of studies uh, on the African continent on the role of the state in. So when you read about Latin America, you read about Asia, the state is sort of central and then the state's interaction with global corporations. In this context, I mean, that that's even political, not a lot of political economy studies will even feature the state. But in, in this context, the role of donors is extremely important and it's because they, they are pushing through the Green Revolution and it's essentially like, where is the state? So it's not a matter of like global corporations coming in and controlling everything. They go through donors that influence the state. And that entire story is missing. And I think a lot more needs to be said on that process. Um, and it's so much so that I would also, I also have this hypothesis or this kind of story I'm thinking about investigating is looking at the way that donors and global corporations go through other certain African states to control other African states. So for example, when you go to Ghana, all the main um, grocery outlets, for example, are South African. And when you talk to an extension agent about where they're getting their seed and chemicals, South African. I mean, there are global corporations that go to South Africa that Ghana goes to South Africa for. What does that relationship look like? What is going on there, I think is, um, striking, and I've never read anything about these power dynamics. So I think I'm still, I mean, I've never, there's very few, very little literature on agroecology. There's very little literature, even on the African Green Revolution from the African context that we're, we're still trying to, to learn from. And I think it is different than other places. So, Wondering about the ecology side of agroecology, is there anyone at the university who is trained in, in the politics of this work too? Or the community that were there bringing in traditional knowledge about um, what crops go together, how they will end up with that sort of thing? Yes. So, <laughs> I so my research has been more of like a citizen science approach with farmers and the extension agents, the so the extension agents, the technical people, the technical officers that are closest to them, which are the ministry staff. So I've chosen to work as closely to the farmer and the communities as possible to learn. The reason that is not a that is a strategic choice because all of the agronomists and soil scientists and other seed experts at the local universities are all Green Revolution funded people. So in all the researchers who work with them are funded by big donors. So it literally when you meet a researcher, another PhD student, let's say, or another professor, and they're like, oh, you're here working on agriculture, which, um, which crop do you focus on? And it's like, um, all of them. Like, I, because the way they do their research is like very technical and it's not based on a system. It's or even if it's based on a system, it's one commodity system and not the way people actually feed themselves. Uh, so I have chosen to work with people who I think are have the, the farmers' interests best at heart and that and, and there's still contentious relationships between, I mean, government extension agents are notoriously horrible. Like oftentimes they don't do their job at all. They receive no funding. They don't even get money to go visit the farmers like for fuel money. They don't even have motorcycles to go to the farm. But the ones that I've worked with are very good. And so I just chose to situate myself there. And they have all sorts of pilots. And what's very interesting to me is now donors that are interested in kind of sustainable intensification or climate smart agriculture, they are putting big money into testing some of those 
Like, how can we have companion crops in this place? Like something like phonu, which is a northern, uh, northern crop. How can we have it com grow in complementary to uh, rice or maize or soy or something else? They're doing these tests for the first time that I've seen that uh, in ten years. Whereas before it was like, what? How can we most efficiently get this high yielding seed variety of maize on this monocrop to farm? So there is some shift towards something that's more sustainable, but it's still very much with the idea of like efficiency business first and not how people actually, think. in this context, people, when they farm, they think about feeding their families first. So any decisions that they make, that's the priority. So if you go in being like, how can we get them to make money? It's already in conflict with their priorities and values. So they are never going to act the way, the farmers are never gonna act the way that you, the contractor wants them to act. And there's so much battling and resistance in, in, in this place between the contractors, the businessmen, and the farmers. Farmers, and I have actually the ministry day that we had of influence. Most of the day was spent with the businessmen yelling at the farmers and the farmers yelling at the businessmen. That, that was most of the day. That was me. Uh, but often, often there'll be one farmer who does take the money and take the stuff, right? Yeah, and that's the inequality piece. That's the dispossession piece. And I think another interesting study for anyone who's watching this or going to watch this, and I cannot do this research, but I would be curious to know what the role of the African diaspora and the role of Southern Ghanaians is in this dispossession story. Because the people who are farming large commercial plots, these urban educated elites, are not from necessarily from the communities themselves. So where are they coming from? They're coming from the South, they're coming from the diaspora, that's where the money is. And so it's it's a foreign land grab, but not a foreign land. It's happening from within in different ways uh, that I think is an important story to tell. So someone do that project, please. Uh, yeah, that, so yeah, the ecology side of things, it's not, I'm not a, a scientist. Uh, I do more social science and, you know, I, ideally working in agroecological research, I would like to to work more with the, those scientists to to carefully um, carefully understand all the different farming techniques because it's really complicated with these farmers. Their farms are amazing. They're like um, compared to the Green Revolution farms or the conventional farming, they're like oasis oases in the middle of a desert. They're like lush and green and there's animals and fish ponds and it's a, they're amazing places to be. And I think if ordinary people, everyday people saw those farms at that at those moments, they would be convinced to to I want to live there, I don't want to live there. You know, I want to eat from there, I don't want to eat from there. So that's that's part of the ambition, I think, us to translate the research and then work with these organizations to to get that message out there. Great. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing your work with us and we look forward to the uh, documentary next month. Yes, thank right, you thank so you. much. Thank you.